Today, uh, we are going to look at uh, John chapter 15, and um, Jesus, before he goes to the cross, in John 15, brings up a particular subject that has got to be one of the most important subjects that would, he would ever discuss with his disciples. It was a conversation to set them on the right path, even after he goes to the cross and then ascends back into heaven. But conversations have consequences, sometimes good, sometimes bad. In 1903, the Wright brothers pioneered human flight. Now let me tell you how that started. A couple brothers own a bicycle shop in Ohio, right? And one of them said, I don't know, I'm making this up, but I'm just, you know, you got to imagine, something happened. And they said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could build something that was like a flying machine and you and I could actually fly? And everybody who heard that conversation laughed at them. Are you kidding me? That's impossible. If God wanted men to fly, he would have given them wings like birds. You, you, you are trying to do what cannot happen. But these two guys... They thought, but maybe it could. So they begin to develop things. And in 1903, they flew the first plane with a human on board. Now let me tell you what a cool flight that was, okay? It was all of 12 seconds long, and they flew 120 feet, and they... The altitude was between 8 and 14 foot high. And you say, well, that's like not at all impressive. No, of course not. But that was the first of several flights they engineered. Second flight was the same, 12, 12 seconds long. They flew 175 feet, so they got further. The third one was, the fourth one was 59 seconds, and they flew... Um, 852 feet, and something changed in human history. From that point on, other conversations have been had. Like, I wonder how far someone could actually fly in an airplane. I mean, 800 feet is not worth very much, right? But then... In 1927, on May 20th, Charles Lind, uh, Lindbergh had this idea with the emerging technology of the airplane that he was going to try to cross the Atlantic Ocean, 3,600 miles of a distance. It took him 33.5 hours, but he did it, and the first intercontinental flight had taken place. Impressive. Growing up as a missionary kid, I've made lots of those flights. I'll never get over the fact that you can get on an airplane and fly somewhere between 13 and 16 hours from the west coast of the United States all the way to China and the Philippines and Japan and Korea. Because people had conversations. I wonder if we could fly. I wonder if we could fly far. And then the third conversation that they had was, I wonder if we could fly faster. Chuck Yeager, on October 14, 1949, did what the engineer said could not be done. He broke the sound barrier. He flew faster than sound, which is somewhere over 700 miles an hour. You know, he describes the experience that when he began to approach, um, he began to approach what they call Mach 1, which is the sound of, uh, the, the speed of sound, that, the, I mean, the plane started shaking. He said his vision blurred. His stomach was in knots. He thought the plane was going to implode. And then, boom, a sonic boom was heard. And he began to fly faster 
than the speed of sound. Anyone here remember the Concord? You remember the Concord? Of course you don't. There, thank you. Someone does remember the Concord. The Concord flew faster than the speed of sound. It shortened the distance. It was in, it's like a seven hour flight or an eight hour flight to London and they could do it in under three hours. You know, Jesus has this conversation with his disciples and he basically has one theme in John 15, uh, beginning in verse one. You can go all the way down to seven, verse 17. And this is the theme of that whole passage. It's the theme abide. Actually, the word abide appears between, I think, nine or ten times in those few verses, abide. You know, I'm not like a literary genius, but when, when you keep repeating the same word over 17 verses, the theme emerges, right? And this is what Jesus said to his disciples. I'm, he's going to go to a cross. They're fighting over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who's going to sit on the right hand and the left hand. A lot of tension in the room. And then Jesus pulls them all together. And this is, this is the, just before he is betrayed. And he says, I just want to tell you this. Here's, here's, here's something I want you to always remember. What would that be? This is it. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Are you getting it? I'm the vine. Jesus, this is Jesus, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, what's going to happen? He's going to bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done to you. Are you kidding me? It's like he's taking out the divine credit card, and he's saying, you you abide in me, you you ask for what you want, I'm going to give it to you. Now, he, he goes on, but... But by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. Did you know that God wants us to live fruitful, meaningful lives? Do you know he's on our side? He is working so that you and I can bear fruit. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that you may have joy, that that my joy may remain in you and your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call call you servants for a servant does not know what what his master is doing but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father I've made known to you you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed that you should go and bear fruit I mean what Jesus is saying is I, I'm telling you what the plan is I, I'm you're coming in as a partner in this whole effort this mission you're my friends you and I understand what we're trying to accomplish here and I'm here to help you I you didn't I chose you and appointed you so that you would go and bear much fruit and that your fruit would remain and whatever you ask the father in my name he may give you these things I command you that you love one another and so I just want to pull out pull out a few thoughts here and then I want you to hear from somebody who is who his life illustrates the difference between visiting God and knowing God and abiding in God. First of all, it's this, it's the obvious. Abiding in Christ is all about a relationship and it is possible for you and I to abide in Christ. This is, this is the word abide isn't visit, uh, it isn't go to church. The word abide means I want your life to be so intertwined with the presence of God that the fruit comes in your life because you're always with God, thinking about him, doing what he says, obeying him. Do you know that you will absolutely be shaped by the relationships in your life? You can't help it. 
God says, I want to be the relationship in your life. And if I am that relationship, fruit's going to come. You know, when I read through the Old Testament, there are some people that I, I just love because they illustrate what it's like to abide in Christ. Um, for instance, Enoch, uh, early on in Genesis, he's a man that walks with God. That's how he's described. He walked with God and he was not because God took him. I mean, walking with God, that's abiding. Um, Hebrews later on describes that he, Enoch, he actually was a man living on the earth who pleased God. And then it goes on to say, but without faith, it's impossible to please God, but because you must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, those who abide in him. So here's a prayer. God, I know you are there. I believe that you are constantly at work. I want to walk with you and abide in you, and I want you to teach me what I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to do it, and I'm asking you to make me into the person you want me to be. Transform me. I love Enoch. Number two, the second guy I think about is David. You know what David prayed in Psalm 27? This, this one thing I want, God. Here's, here's the one thing I want. I mean, he was the king already. He was a valiant warrior. I mean, he was the most famous man in Israel, probably the greatest king Israel ever had. But you know what David in Psalm 23 says is the cry of his heart? This one thing I want. I just want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I want to gaze on his beauty. God, I just want to be with you. I want to know you. Most of the time, people tend to be so busy. How about you? Are you so busy about your schedule? God, I don't have time. I'll see you Sunday. But God says, you, you know how your life could change? You could go from walking to flying to soaring if you would abide in Christ. Of all the things to remember, one is the preeminent in this passage. You need to abide in Christ. One of, one of the favorite passages I, I, I read in the Old Testament is in Exodus 33, Moses. Moses is the leader of the children of Israel, and boy, they're a, re they're a renegade group, I'm telling you. Rebelling, very disappointing while, while Moses is up in the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, in the middle of the conversation he's having with God, God stops him and says, Moses, go back down the mountain. These people, uh, you got to go see what they're doing. You know what they had done? They, they had taken their gold, melted, that, melted it and crafted it into a golden calf. It was an idol that they now were worshiping in all of the most lewd and uh, ugly ways. And God says... He, his, he says, they're, they're destroying themselves. Moses comes down the mountain. He deals with them. And then God comes to him in verse th chapter 33 of Exodus. And he says, Moses, this is what God says. I, I'm going like, to destroy them, and I'm going to start all over with you. Moses pleads for his people. And then finally God says, all right, here's the deal. You, I'm going to send my angel ahead of you. You will get the promised land. It will be the angel of God that will help you defeat your enemies. I mean, I'm going to give you what you all want, but I'm not going with you because, I mean, I just can't do it. I'm afraid I may kill the whole bunch of you because of your rebellious hearts. And you know what Moses said? He says, God, I don't want to go. If you're not going to go with us, I don't want to go. God, I'd rather stay right here in the desert in your presence. You know, you, know, you know what sometimes my problem is? Is God, give me what I want and leave me alone. Do you ever feel that way? God, how many times do I have to go to church a month in order to get what I want? You know what that's called? That's called religion. 
let's work God in such a way that we're, you know. You know, if you're a parent, you know when your kids are working you. Do you know that? You know, I may, I may have somebody who comes to see me once in a while and, Dad, I, I love you. I love you. Huh. Like all of a sudden, in the middle of the morning, you love me so much. This is amazing. What do you want? Can we go to the dollar store? But abiding is desiring the presence of God more than you want the blessing of God. Knowing that the fruit of God's presence is what's going to satisfy you. It's going to give your life meaning and purpose. And Moses says to God, God, I don't want to go if you won't go with us. You know what God does? Okay, I'll go with you. Jesus said, this is the most important thing, disciples. I mean, it was going to get hard. It was going to get confusing and complicated. I mean, the, the, the amazing thing is, y'all are arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom when really I want to be with you all. You got the wrong discussion and the wrong question. I have chosen you, all of you, because I, I want you to be on mission with me. I want your life to be fruitful. Secondly, if you abide with God, you're going to get the fruit. Um, so how do you know if you're abiding with God? Well, if you read Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 24, and we won't go into great detail, but <clears throat> here's the deal. Here's the works of the flesh, and the, here's the fruit of the Spirit. So if what's going on in your life is adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness, you're not abiding in God. You're not abiding in Christ. Uh-uh. You, that's hard, not hard to figure out, right? I just described to you our cultural focus. Did you know that? You look at entertainment, you listen to TV, you read, read articles, and uh, hey, it's all about adultery, although we don't want to call it that anymore. It's, it's about unbounded sexual expression in any direction, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. Lewdness is vulgar talk about things that are all in that category. So if that's what you're doing, I'm just going to say, hey, friend, that is not the fruit of the Spirit. You need to say that to yourself. It goes on. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and of the like, as of which I... I tell you before, I've told you before, just as I also told you in time past, those that practice such things, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's not the fruit of, that's not the fruit of God. What the fruit of the Spirit is this? The fruit of the Spirit is against all odds, against all provocation, against all disappointment, against all hurt, regret, woundedness, love, joy, peace. Can you imagine? No matter what's going on in your life, the fruit of the Spirit is going to give you all of those things. He's going to give you love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the gifts. You know what the gift is? A transformed character and heart. That's the gift. And when you have a transformed character and heart you will be giving gifts to the people around you. Because when they know you and see what God is doing in you, they'll be affected by you and they'll catch a vision of what could be instead of being content with what is. Lastly, in Revelation chapter, um, I think it's five, Jesus is speaking to the seven churches he goes to one church in Laodicea, and he has some pretty stern things to say to this church. Now, I want to just set the stage here. These are people that say they are Christians. These are people that are followers of Jesus, that they're in a church. Do you get what I'm saying? 
Um, <clears throat> but he says, here's the problem is that you're neither hot nor cold. You're just indifferent about everything. And then he uses graphic imagery when he says, I, I, I'm, ready, I'm ready to vomit you out of my mouth. I mean, I wish you were hot or cold, but your, your indifference makes me want to throw you up. And also, you're so self-satisfied. You say that you're rich and in need of nothing. You're pretty pretty satisfied with everything in your life. You are unable to see the things that really you're struggling with. Uh, Why do you have anxiety? Why are you struggling with a sense of purpose and meaning? Uh, you, You think that you're rich and you've got everything you need. And this describes all of us in this country. But really, he said, you are You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And then he calls on them and he says, what you need to be doing is you need to be buying from me gold that is refined in the fire uh, so that you will truly be rich. You you need a white linen to cover the nakedness of your sinful and shameful ways. You need eye salve. You need to get it from me. And that ISAB is going to give you the opportunity and the ability to see what really needs to be seen. So you can do what you need to do. I love you. I rebuke and chasten you because I love you. And then Revelation 3.20. Behold. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in with him and dine with him and he with me. This is a picture of abiding. That's so interesting to me because you see, what's described here is a door, someone inside, and the person on the outside knocking. Knocking is a request to enter. But the person knocking is God Almighty. He could blow the door down. He could barge in. But he says, what what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand here and I'm going to knock because maybe the time will come when you will invite me in because you will be asking me to come in and abide with you. And you're going to trust me to deal with you and help you. And, and maybe you could have intimate discussions with me. Tell me really what's up. What's really going on in your life. Know that I love you. You, you know, you never really tell God anything. Did you know that? Because he knows it already. But you need to tell him what he knows that you and I are so expert at ignoring and denying. And you need to say, God, I failed. God, I need to change. You know, you know what he's looking for? He's looking for a relationship with each one of you. And that's what he told his disciples they needed most of all. They needed to abide in him. It'll change your life. You know, I want you to hear the story of Zeus Tucker because he so clearly describes how he went from not abiding to abiding and how it changed his life. Zeus, come on, talk to us. I was asked to share my testimony today. And so yeah, I'm gonna tell you my story. In 2016, I said I gave my life to Christ. I said the sinner's prayer, then I got baptized a few months later. I was reading scripture for like a month and only prayed to God when I wanted something from him. I had a temporary change in nature because I had no spiritual discipline. 
When it was time to go back to school, I totally lost sight of the commitment I made to God. I went back to believing that my will was right and I knew more than everyone else. I was a boy who was led by the lust of my eyes. I had a problem submitting to authority. I got OSS and ISS more times than I can even count. I was so disrespectful to my parents and family members. When I was mad, I would make threats and use disrespectful language towards them. It didn't matter who was right, I was right, and that's all that mattered. When I got engaged in 2019, I was struggling with depression, anxiety, self-doubt, and suicidal thoughts. I remember thinking about getting so drunk that I would let myself fall off a bridge, that my family and the whole world would be better off without me. I started to believe in Satan's lies over God's truth. I was a slave to sin. And I was being led to death. July 17, 2020, I married my beautiful wife, Megan. Made a commitment to love her unconditionally for the rest of my life. Marriage was fantastic for the first few months until it wasn't. We as men are called to be the spiritual leaders of our homes and that I was not. Our arguments were confrontation with no resolution. We would argue about every little tiny petty thing. I felt so disrespected by her, I started to hate her. I started to hate my own wife. I told her, I hate you. I can't be intimate with you. And I wish I never married you. I told her that so many times. So many times. How sad. Imagine the grief in my wife's heart when she heard me say that. I had made a promise to protect her and love her the rest of her life. Something I imagine is, what if one day God just had enough of my disobedience? He looked me in the face and said, Zeus, I wish I never had a relationship with you. That would truly crush my soul. Praise God for his perfect love and abundant grace. I wish I could say that's where it ends, that I finally got it and turned to God, but no. A little after our one-year anniversary, I decided I was done. I've had enough of this woman. I'm not going to ruin the rest of my life for her. I wanted a divorce. To make matters worse, this is right after I found out she was pregnant. I was a man who ran from all responsibilities. I was a quitter. My wife is pregnant with my child, and I threatened to leave her, my child. We ended up living separately, her with her parents and I with some friends. I truly believed I was making the right decision. Even my friends supported it. I convinced myself I was right and Megan was wrong about everything. It's funny though. When you know God, you realize you're wrong about everything. And the ones who don't are usually the self-ignorant who only care about themselves. The more you know God, the more you know your need for a savior and that your way does not work. Your way will never work. I was a lost soul in need of a savior. Here's some scripture I read a few months ago and it's truly changed my perspective and relationship with God. So I would love to share this with you guys. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Christ lays it out plain and simple. There is two choices. It's the concept of A and B. There's only two roads. 
There is a way that is so wide and easy that leads to hell that many will enter. There is a way that is so small, so hard that only a few will find that leads to heaven. There is only one path to heaven, one gospel, one savior, one Messiah, and that is Jesus Christ our Lord, and we must submit to him and him alone. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Those who are on the broad road will have bad fruit. Bad fruit is disgusting and it smells gross. We know bad fruit is not appealing at all. Don't be confused. There will be times where you might see someone on the broad road and you might see something that looks like good. But what is their true nature? I was a man on the broad road with the confidence of the narrow road with the fruit from the broad road. I said the sinner's prayer. I had so much confidence and assurance in my salvation because something I did. I was a man going to hell. I was on my way to hell. If I would have died, I would have gone to hell. And I truly believed I was going to heaven. And my life showed I did not know God. I was a liar. I almost abandoned my wife and my child. Those who are on the narrow road will have good fruit. There will be undenying evidence that they are of the body of Christ. The fruit is not of ourselves. It's the righteousness of the Holy Spirit, God himself, indwelling the believer. I'm not saying that a true Christian will be sinless, but we will find ways to sin less. When you have a relationship with God, you must have a new relationship and perspective to sin. We must find ways to kill sin. If we don't kill sin, sin will kill us. I don't know about any of you, but whenever I sin, I never find peace. I never find comfort in it. It never fulfills me. I feel destroyed. It kills me. So we must kill sin. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Listen closely. I love Dwayne Johnson. I love his shoes, his energy drinks, his movies. It's, he's awesome. <laughs> I would love to have his physique. I've had so many conversations with people at my gym and also the hospital who wear his shoes. And we just talk about how awesome he is. He's awesome. I love him so much. <laughs> but here's the thing. If I went and knocked on his door and I told his security, let me in. I know Dwayne Johnson. Once he comes to the door, he will tell me plainly, go away, I never knew you, or I don't know you. There must be a relationship with Christ. There must. What is a relationship? Real quick. I have a wife. Some of you guys might be married, have a girlfriend, boyfriend. If you don't talk to your other for a day, how's that relationship? If you don't talk to them for a week, how's that relationship? If you don't talk to them for a month, how is that relationship? I used to be a proclaiming Christian who never read my Bible, who never prayed to God. We know just like a normal relationship, it takes communication. It takes discipline. It takes work. God wants us to have discipline to love him. He's not asking some craziness. He just wants us to love him, to surrender our lives to him. A relationship with Christ. All right. Right now we have the two roads, broad and the narrow. We have the good versus bad fruit. Then we have a relationship versus no relationship. A relationship with Christ leads to evidence, good fruit, that you are on the narrow road. No relationship with Christ leads to evidence, bad fruit, that you are on the broad road. How do we conclude? What do we do with everything that we just heard? This is Christ himself speaking. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice 
is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. If I had died in one of those clubs, I would have gone straight to hell. My life was built on the sand that shifted with the world. I was out of control. I was a slave to sin, was being led to death. A proclaiming Christian, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I realized I needed a savior. I had to surrender to God. I had to abandon all hope in myself. My way didn't work. I built my life on the firm foundation, the rock that never shifts, the rock that can't be destroyed. It's the relationship with Christ that saves. It's the relationship with Christ that saves. There is no other way that you will ever have peace, hope, or salvation. There is nothing you can do. If I can save you some trouble and heartache and distress, your way will never work. There is only one way, and that is Christ alone. Whoever does not submit to God will spend eternity away from God. Eternity is not just a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years, a billion years. It's eternity. This isn't scripture. But hell is going to be terrible. I truly believe that our worst day on earth is going to seem like heaven compared to hell. And I would never want to go there. I love you guys so much. I was a man on my way to hell. If you are not sure about your salvation, if you are not sure which road you are going, which path, there's only one thing that can save you. It's not a day of surrender, it's a life of surrender. It's not a day of repentance, it's a life of repentance. Christ is my savior, redeemer, and hope. Thank you guys. Can I ask you to stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed? I have a couple questions for you. First of all, do, do you know, do you know Jesus? Have you ever asked him to be your Lord and Savior? Have you ever thanked him for his redemptive work on a cross to pay for your sin that you could never pay for? Have you asked for the gift of eternal life? And if you haven't done that, how about today? How about right now, right where you are, whether you're in the room or online, to say, God in heaven, I need you. I confess my sin. I need to be forgiven, Jesus. I believe you died on a cross to pay for me. And then you rose again. And you have the resurrection to give those who put their faith in you. I want to do that today. Save me. And I think for all of us, we need to today and every day say, God, I want to abide in you. Why don't you pray that right now, this whole room? God, I want to abide in you. I don't want stuff from you. I want you. I don't want you to answer my prayers. I want you to lead me and guide me and give me what you want. And we're going to be down here in the front, and we'd love to pray with anyone that just needs someone to say a prayer with them. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you've got a problem of some other kind. We'd love to pray for you. So we're going to do that now. God, we present this time to you and ask for you to be at work. Thank you for the testimony of Zeus, for your great work in his life and family. Bless them, we pray. And we pray that you'd help us to abide in you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.